Good morning. Welcome to this place, this day, God's house, the place to be together in God with each other. What an amazing blessing, huh? Isn't it awesome to be here? God's given us amazing weather. I think he's actually ordained that spring might actually come and be here. Thanks be to God. How awesome. More importantly, the spring reminds us that life bursts forth again. We are reminded in the spirit that life bursts forth again. And so it is here. And we are here to share it one with another. Brothers and sisters, this is the day the Lord has made. What an amazing blessing that we get to share in it and make the most of it. So I encourage you, let your heart be open. Let your mind be open. Let your body be open. Let everything be open to the movement that God is going to do in this place, is doing here and now. I invite you, let us join together in prayer. Lord, as we come to this place this day, we, we just pray that you would remove from us any distraction, that you would fill us, gracious God, with your Holy Spirit, with an understanding of what the truth and life really are. As we come in, Lord, to this place, that we would not leave outside all the things of life, but that we would bring them in to offer them to you, to say to you with open hearts and open minds, dear Lord, show us the path so that when we go back out into that world, that you would show us, that you would move us, that you would guide us that we would take those things that we brought with us back out into that world with a new understanding and with a new hope. We pray for this world, gracious God, for we know that hope is your gift, that opportunity and mercy come, Lord, from your hand. And so we pray as people who are filled with that hope and believing in that opportunity that we would go out into that world as you would move us that way to see with your eyes the places where we are needed where we take you and where we go to meet you. Prepare our hearts, Lord, we pray for this service, that we would be as you are, servants, that we would have the eyes of Christ to see the world with love and compassion. As we move in that direction, we pray that you would forgive us our sins. Gracious God, the things that would separate us from you the way that we would separate ourselves from you. Take these things from us. Replace them with the pathways of life. Grant us an understanding of grace. And show us, dear Lord, that the greatest gift we have is you and the opportunity to share you with all the world. For all who are in need, we pray your blessing and that we would be a blessing that we will proclaim the good news of God. Bless this service. We pray that it would be a blessing to you. And all God's people said, in the name of Christ, amen. Let's stand and start worshiping.
are worse because we have work and we have school. So then we cram everything that's supposed to be social or fun or anything into the weekend. And then you're up from sunup to sundown running. I hate it. So <laughs> we're just gonna not do it this morning for about an hour and just rest and worship because that's really all that God has called us to do is to be in his spirit and with him. So just focus on that this morning. together lovely, altogether wonderful, altogether glorious and good. And it is a good day to be in the house of the Lord. Amen. 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 Friends, would you pray with me? Good and gracious God, we come to you in this moment, recognizing that you are altogether lovely and altogether wonderful to us. Lord, we ask now that you just open our minds and our eyes to see something fresh and our ears to hear something new. Break our hearts open for the gospel, God. Lord, I ask that you hide me behind your cross so that your children do not see me, but they hear you. In Jesus' name, amen. Friends, this morning I am reading from the Gospel of Mark, the fifth chapter, and I'm reading all the way from verse 21 through verse 43. 
Join me now in hearing the holy and inspired word of God. When Jesus had crossed again in the boat to the other side, a great crowd gathered around him, and he was by the sea. And then one of the leaders of the synagogue named Jairus came, and when he saw him, he fell at his feet and begged him repeatedly, my little daughter is at the point of death. Come and lay your hands on her so that she may be well and live. And so he went with him. And then a large crowd followed him and pressed in on him. Now there was a woman who had been suffering from hemorrhages for 12 years, and she had endured much under many physicians and had spent all that she had, and she was no better, but grew worse. She had heard about Jesus and came up behind him in the crowd and touched his cloak. For she said, but if I but touch his clothes, I will be made well. Immediately, her hemorrhaging stopped and she felt in her body that she had been healed of her disease. Immediately aware that power had gone forth from him, Jesus turned around in the crowd and said, who touched my clothes? And his disciples said to him, you see this crowd pressing in on you, how can you say who touched me? And he looked all around to see who had done it. But the woman, knowing what had happened to her, came in fear and trembling and fell down before him and told the whole truth. And he said to her, daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of your disease. And while she was still speaking, some people came from the leader's house and said, your daughter is dead. Why trouble the teacher any further? But overhearing what they said, Jesus said to the leader of the synagogue, do not fear, only believe. He allowed no one to follow him except Peter, James, and John, the brother of James. And when they came to the house of the leader of the synagogue, he saw a commotion and people weeping and wailing loudly. And when he had entered, he said to them, why do you make this commotion and weep? The child is not dead, but sleeping. And they laughed at him. And he put them all outside and took the child's father and mother and those who were with him and went in to where the child was. And he took her by the hand and he said, Talitha kum, which means little girl, get up. And immediately the girl got up and began walking about. She was 12 years of age. And at this they were overcome with amazement. He strictly ordered them that no one should know this and told them to give her something to eat. The grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of the Lord lives forever. It doesn't matter who you are, whether you are the CEO of your own multi-million dollar company, or whether you bag groceries at Aldi, troubles will come knocking at your door. It does not matter whether you own a six-bedroom house in Ballantyne or you live in an apartment in East Charlotte, sickness and relationship troubles and the death of a loved one and financial troubles will come. It doesn't matter if you are black or white or male or female or young or old or whether you faithfully contribute to the church or volunteer 10 hours a week at Bright Blessings. They come. And when they do, you become weary in the body and mentally drained. And I don't know about you, but when I get physically weary and mentally weary, my spiritual self gets tired. And when my spiritual self gets tired, I feel like throwing in the towel. But it has been said that faithful people versus unfaithful people are the ones who don't give up. Faithful people keep pressing their way through. Unfaithful people give up. A faithful person is someone like Chris Norton. This is Chris Norton. Chris Norton was given a full ride at Luther College in Iowa. And on December, in, in October of 2010, in a Luther football game, Chris suffered one of the worst spinal cord injuries you can ever sustain. 
and doctors told him he only had a 3% chance that he'd ever be able to move anything below his neck ever again. He'd never be able to scratch his nose. He'd never be able to do anything, let alone walk. But while laying in a hospital bed, he said, Lord, I don't care if I ever play another sport again. Lord, just please let me walk. Chris said, I knew that my faith was bigger than my circumstances. And so he began the painful process of beginning to learn how to walk again. And in 2014, with the help of his fiance, who, by the way, he met online on an online dating service, he began the painful journey of walking and then he walked across the stage at his graduation with his fiance holding the bulk of his weight. Chris was not finished yet, however. Last weekend, he walked his bride down the aisle. Uh, I just didn't know how the steps would go. So I was just like in the zone, just wanted to take those nice steps and take my time and enjoy the moment too. Just a couple steps were dip more difficult than others, but I was able to push through it and just keep was able to do it. Just to go from not even being able to take a step to be able to really walk seven smooth, yards. smoothly walk seven <laughs> yards. I don't know if you've seen that. It's been all over the news. When Chris first started to learn how to walk the, for his, to get his diploma, the YouTube video got millions of hits. Now, they have been all over the news, but the one thing that is missed in almost everything is how much his faith has played a role in his journey. If you watch all the different videos and then you compile all the little snippets about his faith, you find out how much his faith has played a role. Here are some of the quotes from the different snippets of everything. Chris said, I knew giving up wasn't an option because with the Lord all things are possible. And his wife Emily said the one thing that she loved about Chris the most was how much he loved God. And Chris said, I knew that God would do for me what I could not do for himself as long as I didn't give up on my faith. In this morning's gospel reading, Mark tells of a father, a synagogue leader named Jairus, desperate for a healing of his dying daughter, and an unnamed woman in the crowd who was desperate also, but for a healing for herself. Both reached out to Jesus in spite of their circumstances and they didn't give up because they believed, like Chris Norton, that Jesus had the power to do for them something that they could not do for themselves. Jairus was responsible for making sure that everything was in order and ready at the synagogue. So Jairus was kind of like the clerk of session at the Presbyterian church, but in the Jewish tradition. It was an important position that came with privilege and prestige and prominence. He would have been wealthy. He would have had a nice home and servants. But you know what? In that moment, none of that mattered. He had a dying daughter, and that was a helpless feeling. In the Gospel of Luke, it said that, he was, that she was his only daughter. So this was the apple of his eye. It was daddy's little girl. And tragedy doesn't care who you are. Sickness and sorrow don't care about your achievements or how much money you have in the bank. And then this broken-hearted, dog, this broken-hearted father knew that none of his resources could fix what was happening with his daughter. So he had heard about this miracle working power of Jesus. It had to be hard for him to go and fall at the feet of Jesus because after all, he was a synagogue leader and none of his colleagues in ministry approved of Jesus. Most of the synagogues were closed to Jesus. So can you picture the scene? Here is Jairus, this synagogue leader, falling at the feet of Jesus. And here are all the people thinking that this highfalutin synagogue leader is falling at the feet. Here was the talk of the synagogue parking lot that Saturday night. Did you see what Jairus did? He just fell at the feet of that Jesus. 
but Jairus didn't care. This was his daughter. When someone you love is sick, you will do anything for them. Anything. And then there was the woman with the issue of the blood. She had been through so very much. She had given everything she had, but enough was enough. She had lost everything. It says that she had been through all the doctors, and doctors' solutions in those days included taking things like alum and crocus and wine and boiling it up and then taking a sip and then saying, flux be gone. I don't know about you, but it wasn't Advil in a heating bottle. Or they would tell her to go meet where two roads crossed. Stand where the two roads crossed and then someone would come up behind her and spook her or scare her. And that was supposed to get rid of the issue of the blood. That wouldn't work. They would even put women like her in a trench and think that was supposed to stop the bleeding. She had had enough. And so she heard of Jesus and she said, I have no faith in man, but I have faith that Jesus can do this. But she wasn't even supposed to be out in public. She wasn't supposed to be out there, let alone touching a man. And so she pushes her way through this crowd. She probably had a veil over her face so no one would know who she was. And she reaches out and she touches Jesus. And she says, I just felt in my body that I was well. You know when you have the flu and you're sick and then all of a sudden you just kind of know that your body is well all of a sudden? She knew in her body that all of a sudden she was well. But Jesus knew something too. He felt that power had gone out of him. And he stops. For this woman that society cared nothing about, he stopped. Jesus will make himself accessible to us. Even though he was on the way to heal this girl who was this rich leader's daughter. And I'm sure Jairus was standing there saying, she could have waited an hour. My daughter is dying. You were supposed to be with me. But he stopped for this woman. Jesus was the one who said, the first shall be last and the last shall be first. He will stop for us. And he said, who touched me? And the disciples, they kind of laughed and said, Jesus, don't you see all these hundreds of people? They're all touching you. And Jesus says, who, who touched me? And she is so nervous. She says, it, it, it was me. I touched you. And she falls at his feet and she tells him the whole story. Look, I've been bleeding and I've lost my identity. People even call me the woman with the issue of the blood. They don't even call me by my name. We don't even call her by her name. We don't even know her name. We call people, oh, that's the woman with cancer. He has AIDS. We lose our identity when something happens to us. I was known when I was a kid, God bless you. I was known when I was a kid as the unicorn. My dad gave me that name. I was hyperactive when I was a kid. And so I would run into walls and I had this big egg on my head most of the time when I was a kid. So my dad would call me the unicorn and then my friends thought it was funny but I was known as the unicorn. I lost my identity for a little while as a kid. I didn't want to be known as the unicorn, but I was. And this woman pours her heart out, and then Jesus says to her, my daughter, it was not touching my clothes that made you well. See, she had been through so much hocus pocus, he wanted her to know, it wasn't touching my cloak, it was because you had so much faith and didn't give up. That's what made you well. Your faith made you well, go. You're healed of your disease. And then Jesus continued on his way. And when he did, Jairus was stopped and a bomb was dropped on him. They said, your daughter, is dead. 
stop bothering this teacher. And Jesus says to him, don't stop, don't give up, just keep believing. And isn't that what the Lord says to all of us? Don't stop, no matter how awful your circumstances are, no matter what you are going through, no matter how bad things are, even if you lose someone that you love, don't stop, just keep going. And they keep going and they get to Jairus' house and Jairus' house is filled with all kinds of people wailing and crying. And back in that time, and even still today, it is a Jewish tradition that they maintain this certain protocol of grieving. And so they would hire professional mourners. And Jesus says, why are you doing all of this wailing and crying? I know it's not real. Stop it. Get out. And he throws them out because he knows the only people that are really truly hurting are Jairus and his wife. And so he takes them and he takes them into their daughter and he holds her hand and he says, little girl, get up. You're not dead, you're just sleeping. Your spirit has left you, but spirit come back into this body and she gets up and she walks and he says give her something to eat because he's an always compassionate Jesus everyone in the room when Jesus was there was laughing at Jesus because Jesus had told them before he threw them out that girl is not dead stop crying you know, when Chris Norton was in the hospital, he felt a little tingle in his toe, and he told the doctor, I can feel a tingle in my toe. The doctors laughed at him. They said, Chris, you are never going to walk again. What you're feeling is a phantom feeling. You're not really feeling anything. And Chris said, I know what I feel, and I'm going to prove you wrong because my God is bigger than anything you could ever imagine. And Chris didn't give up. He kept pushing, and that's why he walked down the aisle that day because his God is bigger. Our God is bigger than anything those doctors in the flesh could imagine. God was bigger than the doctors who tried to help that woman with the issue of the blood. God was bigger than anything the disciples could have imagined, anything that the people in the room with Jairus could have imagined, bigger than the men who came and said, stop bothering the disciples. Stop bothering Jesus. I think that all of us can relate in one way or another to everyone in the Gospel of Mark. Maybe you are just simply in the middle of the crowd and you want so badly to reach out to Jesus, but everything that is going on in your life is just crushing you and you just have lost your way, don't give up. The Lord knows you are there, and he will stop for you like he stopped for that woman. Maybe you are the woman, and you have been through so much with so many doctors, or you've tried so long to get a job, and, and you just haven't got it. Don't stop. The Lord knows you are pushing your way through, and if you reach out your hand, he will reach out too. He feels you. Maybe you're Jairus, and you're going through life, and everything is great, and the rug gets pulled out from underneath you. Your loved one got sick, or you lost an incredible job, or finances aren't right, and you feel like the bottom is about to fall out. Jesus said to him, don't stop believing. Don't give up. Or maybe you're the disciples and you're calling out to the Lord, but then all of a sudden you think, he's not going to notice me. There's so many people that have needs that are so much more important to me. Don't give up. The Lord knows he is already here for you. 
Or maybe you're like the messengers who came or the mourners who think everybody's so much more important and, and <laughs> I'm here for my friends, but, you know, I'm really just here for them. I don't believe all this Jesus stuff. God knows you're struggling with your faith and he's a patient God because with God all things are possible. Don't give up. God sees all that you are enduring and he knows the desires of your heart and your struggles and your situations and your circumstances and he is much more interested in what you are going through and what you are going to become than what things are are for you in the moment. Keep pressing. Keep the faith. Don't give up on him, on yourself, or on anyone else around you. God loves you. Jesus said, just keep believing. Don't give up. My friends, don't give up. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. My friends, we have the opportunity to give back a portion of what God has blessed us with so abundantly. There's a vessel in the back of the room so that we can give an offering to the church and to the community and to the world. And while our praise team is singing, we encourage you at your will to go back and give us an offering in the vessel, to give God an offering in the vessel.
Friends, would you pray with me? Good and gracious God, we thank you for the opportunity to give back to you and we give back with joyful hearts. Lord, we thank you for blessing us over and over again. We love you and we praise you, amen. And now my friends, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, until we meet again, may God bless you over and over again, amen. <clears throat> stand as we sing our benediction. you